Hello and welcome to the Apologetics 315 podcast with your hosts, Brian Auten and Chad Gross. Join us for conversations and interviews on the topics of apologetics, evangelism, and the Christian worldview. You know, you don't act like a scientist. You're more like a game show host. Hello and welcome to the podcast. This is Brian Auten. And I'm Chad Gross. And we're looking forward to today's interview with Justin Brierley. You're unbelievable. Yes, that's right. Justin Brierley from the Unbelievable Radio Program. And uh, if you're not familiar with that, it's time to get familiar with that. Uh, Justin's been working in radio, podcasting and video for almost two decades. He hosts the Unbelievable Radio Show and podcast on Premier Christian Radio, based in the UK here, as well as the Ask N.T. Wright Anything podcast. He is theology and apologetics editor for Premier Christian Radio, and occasionally contributes to other shows and podcasts from the London-based station. He was also editor of Premier Christianity magazine from 2014 to 18, for which he continues to contribute articles. Justin's first book, of which we'll be talking to him a little bit about today, is called Unbelievable? Why, after 10 years of talking with atheists, I'm still a Christian. And that was published in 2017. If you want to find out more about Justin Brierley, just go to justinbrierley.com and you can find his information there as well as links to his podcasts. And if you want to find his podcast directly, that's at premierchristianradio.com slash show slash unbelievable. Or just check the show notes for a short link, also in iTunes and find podcast platforms everywhere. Chad. What do you find awesome about the Unbelievable Radio Show? Well, there's a list, but I will not go on and on. <laughs> but uh, the the first thing I, I love about it is Justin just does a great job moderating these debates. Uh, things are always kept civil. They're always kept on topic. He does a great job of kind of remaining neutral. Uh, sometimes I wonder how he does it. So I love that about it. I love the guests. I think he has just high quality guests all the time. I love how they are talking about topics that are timeless in a sense, but then also topics that are relevant. And uh, it's a good combination of both. And so those are some of the things I do love about it. I've listened to it. I was trying to figure out today how long, and I, I can't even remember how long. I know it's been a long time. How about you? Yeah, I've been listening to it since I found Apologetics probably back in 2010 or somewhere around there when, you know, the, I started doing the Apologetics 315 blog. I think I've listened to pretty much every episode of Unbelievable. So it's one of those um, podcasts that never gets old because it's always fresh and new. Mm -hmm. Now, we've both been reading Justin's book because when we talk to someone about their book, we like to read it. And so uh, we've really Weird. enjoyed that. <laughs> yeah, we've really enjoyed that. <laughs> And uh, so we're, we're going to ask him a few questions about that. I'm sure we'll, we'll recommend the book enough during the podcast so that we won't talk about it too much now. So let's just jump right in to today's show. Let's get ready. Switch me on. Justin Brierley, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much for having me. It's great to be with you. Yes. It's been a while since we've talked. You've just been going strong on the podcast with Unbelievable. Since we've talked last, you've written a great book, which Chad and I have both thoroughly enjoyed and want to recommend. Yes. Tell us a little bit what's going on in your world with the podcast and any events that you've got coming up. Mm. Well, it's it's it, it must have been a long time since we last spoke, Brian, because the book Unbelievable, Why After 10 Years of Talking with Atheists, I'm Still a Christian, probably came out now at least five or six years ago. Yeah, 2017. Um, if I was writing it now, it would be why after, I don't know, 17 years of talking with atheists, <laughs> I'm still a Christian. Yeah, so so that, that book came out a little while ago, but um, yeah, it, it, it kind of marked a kind of moment, you know, as I say, I started writing it around the 10 year mark of the show when, yeah. when I um, had, had felt I had gathered enough kind of knowledge and insight to be able to write a book kind of defending the Christian faith myself. So. So that that was great. And really that book actually did catalyze a lot of more opportunities to speak and defend the mm -hmm. faith from a personal perspective rather than just being the host of some of the conversations from the Unbelievable Show. So so that was exciting and interesting. And um yeah, and and it's 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 been a busy old time, you know. These obviously podcasting has only grown and grown you know over the years we were very early adopters on unbelievable of podcasting we we started right back in 2007 
and it kind of just grew organically. People picked it up on both sides of the pond. We grew this, you know, this very loyal audience of both Christians and non-Christians who listened. And, and we just saw that, that graph, you know, just keep going up and up over the years. So that was great. And then obviously alongside that, we were starting to do live events, the conference, overseas events as well, occasionally. I think one of the game changers probably in the last few years is we, uh, we were able to secure some uh, funding from the John Templeton Foundation, who, mm-hmm. uh, through whom, with whom we developed this new kind of series spin-off from Unbelievable called The Big Conversation. And that enabled us to bring some big thinkers together, uh, some really interesting conversations. And it really spurred us to actually develop the video side now that exists for Unbelievable. So that was great to launch, effectively launch our YouTube channel at the time and to, to have seen that grown as well. And, and so more or less every show, you know, gets, gets recorded for video as well as for podcast and radio nowadays. And there's a whole new audience who have found the show and enjoy the show now. Uh, that way so so there's been lots of you know exciting activity on that front and um alongside that i've you know developed a few more podcasts and things that that now get um people can download so i i regularly host a um, a show with nt Wright called the ask nt Wright anything podcast and uh, we've developed a few more from from premier such as the cs lewis podcast with alistair mcgrath and a new a new one called unapologetic which is more sort of one-to-one conversations on faith and belief and uh, and that sort of thing. So, yeah, it's been it's been a busy time and uh, like everyone, I ended up working from home most of the time during COVID and have kind of stayed working from home most of the time to be honest. So, mm-hmm. loads of the shows now do get recorded from my kind of home studio as it were and that's that's yeah. So, so it's it's been a yeah. That's that's a whistle stop tour of the last yeah. uh, 7 to 10 years, Brian. Well, one of the things that you mentioned in the book uh, that we're talking about was that when you started you weren't really familiar with apologetics and I'm reminded of that as you were talking about, I thought, oh, I ask NT write anything. That's what a great, you know, opportunity just to sit in a class and learn at yeah. the same time as host that. And yeah. you've mm. moderated so many this great discussions and conversations and debates. It's been like a front row seat to learn so much. I'm kind of interested in how, how you responded at first, not knowing about apologetics and like, whoa, did you think, I, I need to start learning this stuff, you know, to, to be more equipped. Or- yeah, I, I guess, you know, I, I I wouldn't say I'd even heard of the phrase apologetics when I began, you know, around the time I began The Unbelievable Show. I mean, it seems bizarre now, to, but it I guess apologetics, in a way, the, the whole kind of area of apologetics in the church has, has blossomed since I started the show. And I think I kind of, in a sense, was fortunate to catch a wave when, you know, on the heels of the new atheism kind of becoming a big deal, you know, in the mm-hmm. mid two thousands, the show kind of was, was born around that time. And so there was kind of lots of people looking for responses to that kind of material. And I quickly learned that there was this, this area of, of uh, apologetics and that there were some really good thinkers and writers and so on. And so I, I just, you know, very much learned as I went along who, who the people were gradually got to know, you know, who, who I could bring on the show um, and, and what would make for the best conversations and along the way, as you say, it was like an education of sorts um, going from, you know, I, I knew a few things, you know, I, I had some basic knowledge of some what, you know, you could call basic Christian apologetics. I'd read Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis and that sort of thing by that point. But but um, yeah, I would say it was really it, it was being able to sit and listen and hear and moderate some of these debates that, that really helped me to kind of get a much broader picture mm-hmm. of how Christian faith can hang together you know about these some of the intellectual arguments for it and uh and, and obviously uh, alongside doing the show myself i was also starting to listen and to a lot of different christian thinkers and apologists i was starting to read much more widely um and and all of that you know all fed into me starting to develop my own sort of um approach and, and how i would which is kind of what you see in the book you know as i say mm-hmm. 10 years in to, to that journey i wrote the book and and that was the point at which I felt that, you, you know, I'd kind of, these were the key arguments that I think kind of, for me, make the most compelling case for faith. And these yeah. are the key objections that need responding to and so on. And I think I, I kind of had worked out enough to know where I stood on some of the key theological issues that you kind of have to try and try and get to some kind of resolution on in order to kind of make, make things fit together. So, so that was where I found myself. And, uh, and yeah, it was, it was a, an absolute privilege to have that opportunity kind of you know, 17 years plus now of, of just yeah. having 
be, you know, being able to listen and learn from some of these, these great minds across both sides of the aisle, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Justin, it's really great to meet you. Uh, I've been listening to you. I was telling Brian, I was trying to remember how long it's been. I couldn't remember. <laughs> it's been a while. And uh, just yeah. uh, it's it's really just an honor to talk to you. And I really enjoyed your book. And one of the things you you put in the book there is in talking about apologetics and not being familiar with it. And I think that's a lot of people in the church is that modern apologetics kind of has an image problem, you say, because it's often viewed as kind of merely an intellectual exercise for, you know, intellectuals mm-hmm. and academics or so. And, and many see it separate from say the real world. Mm-hmm. Uh, what, what are some ways that you think modern apologists can begin to kind of improve the image of apologetics or maybe as you state in your book, kind of what's a good apologetic for <laughs> apologetics? <laughs> yes. Yeah. For me, it, it is about, you know, and what I've always strived to do with the shows I've produced is to, take apologetics out of the ivory tower it sometimes inhabits of just you know highbrow thinking and you know big ideas and kind of try and put it at the level where the average christian can can hopefully access it and and, and access it usefully i think the great danger you know with apologetics is is you can end up essentially just dealing with arguments just dealing with with kind of um interesting philosophical or yeah, and, and and that's in some sense, you know, some people love that because it, it's there's there's plenty of people out there for whom that really turns them on. They love the kind of the intellectual, rational, argument based kind of approach to things. Sure. The problem I I think is that that if that can just become an end in itself, and you lose sight of the actual goal sometimes, which is to right. actually bring people into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And for me, that's the most important thing. I'd rather you were a really good evangelist than a really great apologist, if that makes sense. But Hmm. hopefully a good apologist is a great evangelist because actually that's the whole point. It's, it's not about simply winning some sort of intellectual argument. It's about actually bringing someone closer to, to Jesus Christ. Um, So for me, I think, I think it's about finding the ways in which apologetics can really serve the church, can really help Christians to engage and understand the culture they're in can help them to have meaningful, helpful conversations with the people around them. And in doing so, sort of open a door to talking about Jesus and the way in which that makes all the difference. So for me, you know, I I love apologetics, but it's always going to be a means to an end. It's never an end in itself. It Mm -hmm. It has to serve that greater purpose. That's all I'm really, you know, encouraging people to do is to make sure that we keep the main thing, the main thing and not, not get distracted by, by how clever we are sometimes, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a kind of that point you make in the book about, I recall you writing something along the lines of, you know, we can fall into the trap of just defending the God of the philosophers and never get to mm. the God of scripture. Right. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, for me, you know, I, I love the, the philosophical debates. So I, I've loved chairing them. I've loved being involved in them, but there is that danger, isn't there? Of you, Sometimes, even in the process of doing the argumentation, it can it can almost keep God at arm's length because it, it keeps God as an abstract concept almost just to be debated and argued over. And for me, you know, if you're an apologist and you're serious about wanting to bring people to God, you should be praying for people just as much as you should be, you know, mm. debating them on Facebook or, you know, where, wherever yeah. it may be. Because it's got to be both. It's got to be, you know, if we really believe there's a God behind all this, uh, who is, you know, who we are essentially working in partnership with in, in this, then goodness me, let's, let's lean on that God to help us in this and not depend it. You know, if it's, if it's just down to us on our clever arguments, then no one's going to end up in the kingdom that way, are they? So well put. One of the arguments you do share in your book is the fine tuning argument. Um, kind of that idea that, that when the universe began, the, the fundamental forces it birthed were apparently fine-tuned for the emergence of life is the way you put it. And you actually have a really great YouTube video explaining fine-tuning using dice, and it's gotten a ton of views. Can you talk about why the fine-tuning impresses you so much and, and even kind of explain your dice illustration a little bit? Because I think that'd be helpful for listeners. Yeah, I get, I'll give it a go. Um, I guess, you know, <laughs> from early on when when I started talking to some of the the folks involved in the science faith debate, and especially some of the Christians who have been researching and, and looking into the fine tuning of the universe, I just found it a really interesting and compelling argument. Partly, I think one of the reasons I like it so much is because 
it's super interesting and it's it's one that it's really easy to talk to non-Christians about, especially non-Christians mm. who are interested in science and the universe and the cosmos. If you start from like the reliability of the script of scripture or the you know the argument for the resurrection, you want to get there potentially, but it's it's often not the thing that kind of immediately kind of captures a lot of people. A lot of people who are kind of more scientifically minded, they're they're really interested in this concept once you start talking it through. You know, what why was the universe birthed with these extraordinarily finely tuned parameters? you know, these fundamental constants and numbers that had to be just the way they are in order for life to develop in the universe. So I'm sure many listeners are familiar with with the basics of this argument that there mm-hmm. are this extraordinary number, you know, 30 to 40 sort of very apparently finely tuned physical constants and forces that the universe had to have just the way they are in order for life to be able to develop. I think what's often difficult though for, for you know, lay people to grasp is just how finely tuned these these things are. And what I was trying to do with the dice video was to kind of just give a kind of hopefully memorable uh, analogy of one way of thinking about this. And so, and I do now, the nowadays I do quite a lot of similarish videos on TikTok and Instagram and that kind of thing as, mm-hmm. as reels. But I always find having some kind of visual prop helps to kind of cement the, uh, the lesson. And so I chose a dice uh, or a die, I should say, in its singular form. But uh, I agree. Dice sounds better. You said that does, in the book. Yeah, I was like, it, I total, I'm yeah. with him there. Totally. Yeah. I, everyone says dice, don't they? But anyway, so so when you're thinking about the odds of the very specific nature of this fine tuning, there are these numbers that get thrown around about how if it differed, you know, if the force of gravity differed from its actual value by one part in 10 to the 60 or whatever, then you would not be able to have a life permitting universe and so on. But those numbers still don't necessarily mean a lot to people, even though they are, in fact, extremely large numbers. So I thought, well, well, what's, what's, what's something someone could grasp? So I just thought, well, let's think about it in terms of like the odds of, of rolling, you know, a set of sixes in a row with a die. And so I said, well, let's take a, a single dice. And if you rolled it and you got a six, well, what are the chances of that one in six? If you rolled it twice and the second time you got a six, what are the chances of that? Well, we kind of know maybe from our elementary maths that you you just keep uh, multiplying these odds. So one in six times by one in six is the odds of getting two sixes in a row. So that's one in 36. And you keep going. And, and every time you, you add the chances of rolling another dice sequentially, you, you times it by one in six every time. And so I said, okay, maybe you get lucky, right? Maybe you could roll three or four sixes in a row before you run out of luck. But what, what about if you roll 70 sixes in a row? Okay, what are the odds of that? And I said, well, as it happens, mathematically, if you just did the multiplication there, that would come to one in 10 to the 60. Those are the odds that are stacked against you of getting that Mm -hmm. that many sixes in a row. You might think, well, that's still possible, right? So I I kind of got a mathematician friend to work out. If if you literally stood there rolling a die, you know, giving about five seconds per roll, how long on average would it take you to roll 70 sixes in a row given those odds. And it came out with this ridiculously large number, like a, a trillion, 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 trillion sort of right. years. And that I think helps to people to realize, okay, that's a really long time. Like that's more, far more time than the universe has been around, for instance. Like right. it's like, it's going to take you, it, you're never going to do it basically. You're, it's like, if you, if you had to stand there that long, continually rolling dice, you know, and it took you however many trillion years before you got around to actually rolling. And it was just a hoped, a hoped a neat way of just trying to give, give people a, a quick way of understanding this is a really, really unlikely thing. Okay. And just to then say, well, look, the only way that if someone did that in front of you, they rolled, ten, you know, 76s in a row, you would say, there must have been someone messing with that. There must, the dice must have been loaded. It's not, it couldn't have happened by chance. And, and my simple analogy was, we should adopt the same view with this extraordinary fine tuning of the universe. And the mm. specific idea I was using was this, this, the expansion rate of the universe in, in that video. Again, it can't have fallen out by chance. The numbers are just stacked against that. There must be a design behind it. I do also try to sort of at least gesture towards in the video, the fact that obviously there are people who've tried to come up with other naturalistic explanations for it. Sure. Maybe it's a multiverse. Maybe, you know, we had a, you know, trillion, trillion, trillion rolls of the dice because there are so many universes. But I, and I kind of kind of tried to deal with that very quickly and say, 
but the problem is it's it, you know as far as i'm concerned it's not really a scientific theory uh it's mm-hmm. it's as much a kind of statement of faith as then god god was behind it but yeah it did it did catch on a lot of people watched it a lot of people yes. responded to it as well good old cosmic skeptic in his in his early <laughs> days did a did a response video that that resulted in him coming on the show and us having a conversation about it we've remained friends ever since so it's it's been fun to see the way that video has captured a lot of people's interest and imagination over the years yeah mm-hmm. it's great i think it's really helpful You know, we're talking about arguments for the existence of God. And, you know, obviously that's sort of one of those perennial topics. And you mentioned earlier how, you know, you happen to sort of ride the wave of interest and and the resurgence of apologetics during the rise of the new atheism. So 2006, the the Mm -hmm. God delusion comes out. And for the next five years or so, you've got the four horsemen of the new atheism. And there was so many apologetics responses being written during that time a lot of debates happening. It was really kind of an exciting time as far as seeing debates and things. Mm. Um, But, you know, now the new atheism has sort of lost its steam. And Mm. so I'm wondering from your perspective, you know, seeing what the debates are about, and I'm sure you're constantly thinking about, okay, well, what sort of guests can we have on? What are popular things happening in culture? As culture has been changing, how have you seen the God debate changing and in Mm. what way? I think it has definitely changed uh, in various ways. And in many ways, the first book, you know, written six or seven years ago, even at that point, I was recognizing, as you say, that the steam was kind of running a bit out of the uh, the new atheism. And and now I think it is very much a spent force. You still get corners of it in, of, in the internet, you know, people kind of want to be Richard Dawkins and so on. But it, right. it's whatever cultural cachet it had, I think has has kind of run out because I mean, if you look at the ones who are still kind of doing the rounds, Sam Harris and so on, they're not talking about religion anymore. That's mm-hmm. like, uh, you know, they stopped talking about religion a long time ago. They've got other battles to fight now. They're, they're, they're now in the culture wars. They're in the kind of, mm. you know, all of those different ideologies. Those are the things they're now worried about. And and I think that's quite interesting because it, I, I think there's been a big shift in that way, away from those kinds of Christian atheist kind of classic debates, you know, that were sort of the part and parcel of the new atheist kind of era to a, a very different kind of, you know, to something which has turned into, as I say, a much wider cultural issues where you will often actually find some Christians on the same page very often as, as some of their secular peers, you know, on some of those issues around LGBT or CRT or whatever that those things might be. And the way that that's been, you know, I suppose come through on the show is that we've tended to, we have probably, you know, we don't do nearly as many of the kind of more classic, if you like, God debate shows as, as we used to do. Because people aren't writing as many books or, you know, videos or whatever's around those. We, we, tend, we tend to do, we still do some of those, but we do a lot more that kind of maybe deal with cultural apologetics, cultural issues, where there may not be as, as clear, like, lines of division between the Christians and non-Christians in some of those instances. So when you bring, bring a Jordan Peterson on, who isn't a Christian, yet he maybe is making quite pro-Christian statements, you know, in mm-hmm. the course of having a discussion with someone. Likewise, you know, when I brought Douglas Murray on opposite N.T. Wright, they were both kind of singing off the same hymn sheet to a large degree. And Douglas Murray is is not a Christian. He's an agnostic. He's an atheist, essentially. But he's very aware of the value of Christianity and everything it's done for the West. The things that Christianity has given the Western world are extraordinary. And even though I can't bring myself to believe in Christianity, I don't want it to go away. I think it would be a tragedy if it went away sort of thing. So there's just all those interesting new conversations, really. And funnily enough, uh, if I may plug another book, <laughs> um, I've got an, a, a new book coming out in September, which is precisely on this kind of the way the conversation has shifted, really, um, away mm-hmm. from that that kind of classic new atheist sort of stuff to to these new secular intellectuals like Jordan Peterson and Douglas Murray, the historian Tom Holland, and a number of others who are kind of in the in the secular space, but are actually reconsidering the value of Christian faith and are actually in in many interesting ways bringing it to a new audience. For me, that's really interesting because we're living in very divisive, polarized times. Obviously, we're living in times when I think the new atheism and secular hopes have kind of failed to deliver on any of their promises. Mm. The reason the new atheism imploded was because once everyone in that movement had agreed that God didn't exist and that religion was evil, they then couldn't agree on anything else. And they all started all this (laughs) infighting about, you know, well, are we the brights? Are we atheism plus, or are we just these free thinkers? And 
And, you know, well, hang on, I, I thought atheism was all about defending, you know, feminist rights and, you know, LGBT. No, no, it's it's just about, you know, an oasis of clear thinking. It's, and, and suddenly everyone fell out with each other because no one could actually agree on what atheism actually stood for at that mm. point. And I think that was almost that that just that was just as we were tipping into basically this this headlong rush into the polarizing issues around ideology and so on. And and basically that was what split apart the atheist movement at that point. And it, mm. and it just reminds me that there are lots of different cultural currents that come and go in culture. And that was an interesting one, the new atheism. But now there's a whole new cultural current, which Christians are being affected by as much as anyone else. And the church is having to try and find the right ways to speak into. And those are some of the most challenging kinds of, you know, conversations and apologetic sort of work that needs to be done at this point. And so I, I've, I've written this book kind of in a hopeful way, actually, into all that to say, Christianity, obviously, if you just look at the statistics in the West, you know, Christianity is in decline, church going is in decline, so on. We know, we all know the, the general picture, right. but actually, given that secularism isn't providing any answers and seeing this interesting way in which we're seeing a kind of new conversation spring up of people wondering whether we can live without the Christian story whether in a post-Christian world we can actually have a binding narrative or whether we're all going to just descend into this chaotic kind of culture war <laughs> syndrome. I wonder whether the time is coming when that tide of faith might yet come back in again. And, you know, it is interesting when I've interviewed some some really interesting converts, adult converts to Christianity over the last few years who have, you would not expect them to have become Christians, but they suddenly something clicked so that they they just saw that this made more sense than the materialist perspective, which just wasn't answering any of their deepest questions. And, and for me, that gives me hope that actually maybe the tide is going to come back in on faith. And that's, that's sort of the central metaphor in the book, really, that I yeah. think we might be just starting to see the turning of the tide after materialism kind of reaches its final limit. Mm -hmm. Are people ready maybe to hear the Christian story afresh? And, and my, my hope and prayer is that, that they will be, you know. Yeah, very good. You mentioned Richard Dawkins and recently, uh, I want to say it was last year. I'm pretty sure you had him on. I've listened to, you know, I think every mm. one of your uh, podcasts the last few years. So um, you had him on talking to Francis Collins, right? That's right. Yeah. 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 And um, did he appear to you? Because I know you've had some interactions with him because you write you write about it in the book. He seemed a lot more mellow. And more mm -hmm. winsome on the mm -hmm. show. Did did you get that as well? No, I, I really, I really got that. I mean, I, okay, I, yeah. I, and if I'm honest, you know, when I emailed him, sort of, I wasn't expecting him to say yes because mm -hmm. he's all he's he'd been on once before, and I'd also got one kind of brief interview with him at an event that he did with John Lennox years ago. He almost always says no to anything like that, you know. Yes. But, so I was kind of blown away when I got this this response saying yes. And I think there were a few reasons why he said yes. The first was, it was Francis Collins that I was inviting him on with. And he, he does have a lot of respect for Francis Collins, just as a scientist. You mm -hmm. know, he, he just is a, a very sort of renowned, you know, geneticist. So, so there was that. There was also the fact, as I discovered quite quickly, that he knew about this life-extending treatment that Francis had helped Christopher Hitchens with during his esophageal mm -hmm. cancer um, before yes. his death. And I think that had also meant Richard Dawkins had developed a, a, a quite a degree of respect for him that he'd reached mm. across the aisle in that way. And I think generally, just Richard Dawkins has mellowed anyway. He's not as dogmatic in his atheism as he once was. I think that's, I've got a theory about that, which is that I think he, like everyone else, has come to realise life is complex and when when he was kind of re, re, riding, as it were, the wave of the new atheism, I think it felt like he was sort of heading up a kind of a new movement, you know, that was going to finally put science and reason in its proper place and where it should be. And when it did implode and when suddenly he l lost, I think, probably quite a lot of the cultural cachet that he had had uh, up to that point, and when all the controversies started emerging around comments he made on Twitter and, you know, and sure. all of that sort of stuff, then, you know, a couple of years ago, he got stripped of the Humanist of the Year Award by the American Humanist Association because mm -hmm. he had said the wrong thing about transgender. I think all of that accumulated to make him realise, you know what, this atheist movement isn't necessarily what it's cracked up to be. And I might have a nicer conversation with Francis Collins and some of my atheist friends now. Um, hmm. And and it, I just got the sense that 
he was just interested in having good natured substantive conversations. And I think he he was kind of tiring of some of the political correctness and ideology that had entered the movement from his perspective and meant that he felt he had to tiptoe on eggshells around certain issues for fear of being cancelled or criticised. And I just wondered, I, I just got the sense that that played into his decision to say yes to that because he... I think he just knew that he, he'd kind of have a straight conversation with Francis Collins, however, however much he disagreed with him on the God thing. He, he I think yeah. he just wanted to have a, an honest, straight conversation about it. And, and he knew he'd, he'd get that there. So, so yeah, I was, I was absolutely delighted to bring them together and, and it was a fantastic show. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was funny because when I saw that, you know, I heard the advertisement of the conversation and I'll be honest when I, when I heard it was going to be um, Dawkins, I was kind of like, Oh man, <laughs> you know, like uh, more of that. And then, you know, I went ahead and listened and I had a very similar reaction when I got done. I thought, wow, that was really enjoyable. And I, I thought Dawkins was even winsome at times. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, it was, it was really, it was really fun to listen to. You had a really interesting interaction with him years ago, kind of mm. centered around kind of the moral argument. Yeah. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yes, I, I had I did have a really interesting conversation with him, and, and you're right, it did appear in in the book. Um, and this is going right back to 2008. And do you remember that was around the time that the atheist bus campaign was happening, things like that? Again, it was kind of the the high water mark of the the new atheist period. And and at the time, around that time as well, there were a, a few kind of high profile debates between Christian thinker John Lennox and Richard Dawkins, and one of them took right. place at. At Oxford University, I, w I was uh, happened to get a ticket to go and see it. It was at the Natural History Museum, and it was a very memorable event because I don't know if you've been in the Natural History Museum, but they have this kind of towering skeleton of a T Rex, and that was the kind of backdrop to, you know, Richard Dawkins and John Lennox having this debate on God, and and it That's was great cool. and really fun conversation. I, I remember I actually went with my dad, who who you know is 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 into those things as well. I I managed to go to the sort of the little press conference afterwards and managed to get one or two questions in there. But then, as I was leaving, and I'd I'd been given the address for the sort of after show party, as it were, to to go along to. I was just sort of walking down the road from from the museum towards the the Oxford College where the the the, the party would be, and and who should sort of just trundle up alongside me, pushing his bike along, but Richard Dawkins himself, mm. and he was just you know heading in the same direction to go to the the party. And and so I introduced myself and said, oh, I asked I asked a question in the the press conference, and uh, uh, I sort of said, I'm I I I'm my name's Justin. I run a sort of faith debate show. I'd love to have you on one day and that kind of thing. Mm. And we just made some small talk and whatnot. And I and I said to him, I hope you don't mind if I come and grab you during the party. I'd love to maybe get a, a few words of uh, interview with you because I had my my sort of little recorder with me. So uh, so Julie, I did. You know, as the canapes and drinks were circulating, I I got this chance to. Just kind of have 10 minutes, really. And there was a lot of hubbub in the background. So if you listen to the show from years ago where this went out, you know, you, you can hear a lot of the kind of the background noise as well. But I just sort of had 10 minutes, 10 or 15 minutes to kind of just quiz him on some of the points that he raised and were debated in the, the show. Uh, well, in, in the conversation with John Lennox. Uh, also interviewed John Lennox and several other people. We kind of made a little show out of it in the end. Just the short amount of time I had with Richard Dawkins and the conversation um, there was one moment in that where where he said a few things and we had a little back and forth that felt to me quite significant and it made it up into the book in the end. And it was specifically around this issue of the moral argument. So the first part of my book, sort of, as as we've said, sort of focuses on why humans are here in the first place, looking at things like the fine tuning of the universe and the Big Bang and, and all that. The second part of the book is more kind of focused on why, how we make sense of human morality, human value and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. At one point in the book, I, I I kind of sort of illustrate, I think, the atheist conundrum that there is when it comes to human value and morality through the conversation I had with Richard Dawkins on that night. And and this is how the conversation went. And uh, I've, I, I've got hold of a copy of the book so I can I can sort of relay it word for word. Um, so I said to him, but look, Richard, if we had evolved into a society where rape was considered fine, would that mean that rape is fine? And he said, I'm going to do my best Richard Dawkins accent now. Oh, uh, I don't want to answer that question. Uh, it's enough for me to say that we live in a society where it's not considered fine. We live in a society where selfishness, failure to pay your debts, failure to reciprocate favours is regarded askance. That is the society in which we live. I'm very glad. That's a value judgment. Glad that I live in such a society. 
To which I responded, but when you make a value judgment, don't you immediately step outside of this evolutionary process and say the reason that this is good is that it's good. And you don't really have any way to stand on that statement. And he responded, well, my value judgment itself could come from my evolutionary past. And I said, but therefore it's just as random in a sense as any product of evolution. And he said, well, you could say that. In any case, nothing about it makes it more probable that there's anything supernatural. And I said, okay, but ultimately your belief that rape is wrong is as arbitrary as the fact we've developed five fingers rather than six. And he responded, you could say that, yes. And, um, and I just found, found that a very revealing sort of moment. And I'm not trying to make it a big gotcha moment or anything, but it did reveal that for me, that most obvious instinct we have, that there are really right and really wrong ways of treating people mm. like rape. The thoroughgoing atheist, and I think Richard Dawkins was being completely consistent with his atheistic worldview in saying, yes, it is just as, you know, that moral belief is just as random as any product of evolution. But I think we all understand that that doesn't feel right. That just doesn't feel right. That doesn't, our moral instincts, our moral beliefs can't simply be whatever the latest happenstance of the evolutionary hand that we happen to be in dealt at this moment in time and space. And I think most people don't want to say that. They don't want to agree with Richard Dawkins on that. Right. And, but if they don't, they have to give an account of why we believe that somehow moral beliefs, moral values, things like rape are somehow not just another product of a socio-evolutionary process, that there really is a right and wrong about these things. And, and again, for me, even more so than, you know, interesting arguments like the fine tuning of the universe, that the moral argument, I think, is probably, for me at least, one of the most powerful arguments for God. Because rather than just looking out there, <laughs> what we kind of see in the universe, it, 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 it strikes here. We all feel, I think, we all feel the power of the moral argument because we are all mm. moral creatures. And I, I can see why, you know, great thinkers like Lewis were converted essentially by this argument. because. We don't want the universe to be the way that Richard Dawkins just described it. We don't, that doesn't make sense of who we are. It doesn't make sense of, of this idea that we really do have intrinsic value and dignity. And so for me that, you know, that, that is, it was an interesting moment and, and one that I've sort of spoken of quite frequently, you know, I, I don't know if Dawkins in, in honesty would have come on the show if I'd reminded him of that little interchange, uh, but, but uh, I didn't bring it up at the time and, and he was okay with that. So, but anyway, yeah, it, that, that, it was a really interesting conversation. Yeah. I, I always, I always think of that comment, William Lane Craig, I've heard him say something along the lines of the, the moral argument. You can talk about the big bang and you can talk about uh, fine tuning, but the, the moral argument gets personal. Mm. He says, yeah, that's and, a good way of like putting that. it. Mm, I like that. Yeah, for sure. So I absolutely love the tone of your show. I, I love the tone of your book. You are always, um, I mean, even in the interview today, as you're, you're recounting Dawkins, you're, you're careful to be just uncompromisingly uh, civil and you, you strive for honest engagement. And I was just wondering with so much of the vitriol that you see, especially in online exchanges, at least. Can you kind of offer maybe two or three tips for us, for our listeners that can aid us in keeping conversations on these matters, civil, respectful, thoughtful in the way that you always manage to do? Well, I, I try to, I don't always, you know, manage it. I've, 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 you know, probably written off a tweet or a Facebook post far too hastily when I've be, be, made the mistake of trying to debate someone online. But yeah, I, I, I think, I think in the end, for me, it's always been about remembering that it's another human being that you're interacting mm. with. And, and the problem sometimes is because a lot of these debates these days do happen in the kind of anonymous space of the Twitter sphere or wherever, you don't see the human. And so you, you end up just kind of wading into an ar just you know, a big argument with, with a kind of faceless entity. And that's why I think it is so important. If you, I, I think the real fruit comes from actually engaging with people in person or in a real relational way, at least, even if it's not necessarily face to face and building relationships, because I, I think what really moves the needle is, yes, intellectual arguments may be a significant part of it, but it's actually for them to see that you are interested in them as a person uh, and not just as a kind of 
position to be demolished or something. So, so mm. I think having the the genuine interest and trying to build a relationship and and having honest, you know, conversations where you listen as much as you speak, where you're open to to learning and to to actually, mm. if, even if it doesn't necessarily change your mind, you're you're open to hearing the perspective someone has, and you're not just waiting for them to finish talking so you can you know bring your next apologetic point in. I think also learning when to kind of stop arguing as well because I think sometimes you you have to be sensible and understand you you there are some people who no almost no amount of additional evidence or argumentation is going to move them and you've got to know when to stop as it were you know flogging a dead horse you th- there's no point just continuing this argument if there's no genuine kind of desire on the other side to listen or to potentially change their mind and then you've got to move on you pray for them by all means you know that may be the best most you can the best and most useful thing you can do at that point for that for that person mm-hmm. but don't kind of get annoyed antagonized irate that's not your job it's uh, leave it to god put it in god's hands and and move on and i guess just just to kind of yeah see the bigger picture in all of this to understand that people aren't won or lost on our the strength of our cleverness of our arguments thank goodness <laughs> you know yeah um yes. there's a, a, an awful lot going on there's a whole spiritual dimension to these issues that and hence why as i say we should be praying for people as much as we're discussing or debating with them and for me you know that that i hope just helps to keep us apologists a bit humble as well and realize it's mm. it's really not down to us it's down to god it's down to the holy spirit it's down to the the stuff going on inside someone's soul and hopefully along the way we can put in a thought god can use us in some way to to spark something but in all honesty i think the best witness on my show over the years, lots of there've been lots of people who I've heard of who have unbelievable has been part of their journey to faith, and that's been wonderful. Whenever I hear mm-hmm. a story like that, but it's really just some great argument they heard on the show. You know, mm-hmm. it's it's always been a long process of kind of also just just being opened up to the idea that there might be something in this Christian faith. And yes, that has been an intellectual journey, but often it's also just hearing winsome, kind gracious Christian voices, whether or not they agreed with them at the time, but that a kind of a willingness to come back every time and have open, honest, gracious conversations with people. And that over the period of years can do a lot more actually for an agnostic or an atheist than sort of some whiz bang argument does. That's where I've been privileged in a sense to, to, to kind of make a lot of friends through the show who are not Christians, some of whom have, have become Christians and that's wonderful, but a lot who I've just sort of got to know, you know, on email, on social media, uh, in all kinds of other ways. And it's just been, I I am just happy to be there and I'm just glad they're listening and deciding yes. to, you know, keep up with the show. And, and I just hope I can be as much of a sort of good Christian witness to them as possible in, in that sphere. And, and that's, I think all, all any of us can really ask to do in the end, you know. Well, put. that's good. Thank you. You know, following along on that, based on your experience with uh, interacting with opposing views you know, I think sometimes it's easy for people, especially who maybe they've not, they've been sort of maybe raised in a Christian home or something, and they haven't been exposed to the opposing view, or maybe they're, I think it can be very easy for some people to be exposed to a different view and become very defensive, closed off, and it makes them nervous to hear mm. an op- mm. opposing view. And I'm not just talking about atheism versus Christianity, mm. but maybe a different theological perspective or something. Yeah. What's been your experience of, of how to maybe sort through views when we start evaluating and we're uncertain, that mm-hmm. uncertainty can make us nervous too. And yeah. what sort of advice would you have for people mm-hmm. who maybe experience a little bit of limbo when they're, when they're yeah. you know, looking at issues of faith or questioning or different beliefs and things like yeah. that? I think so much of it, Brian, does depend on the starting point of the person. And I've seen a lot of Christians either kind of have a crisis of faith or even lose their faith altogether because the starting point they were given wasn't really a very solid or flexible foundation. Maybe they were, mm. they grew up in a church where they were taught if the only way of understanding this particular issue, maybe the first few chapters of Genesis or whatever it is, is this way. There's, there's only one way. And if, if it's not this way, the whole thing is goes away. And I can understand why people, you know, when they get exposed to other points of view, other types of theology, they, they maybe start to kind of question their faith if they've been told this is, this is, I thought there was only one way of understanding this. 
what I wish churches would do would actually be to to kind of ground Christians in a more robust kind of th- theological framework where they they kind of almost just catechize them more in in sort of the the historic Christian faith and the fact that there have been a variety of ways of understanding a number of different issues and that mm-hmm. and that there is a mere Christianity there is there are essentials of the faith that's why we have creeds that's why we have a uh, you know a, a historic orthodox Christian faith but that historically you know Christians have taken different perspectives on on all manner of issues and yet still managed to find common ground and still manage to to see Christ as being the unifying factor behind all of that. And I just feel like so many issues wouldn't be issues if if there was a better sort of grasp of the the le- length and depth and breadth of the Christian faith in that way. So one of the first things I I just want someone in that position to do is just to say look go and go and read, you know, the church fathers, go and read some of the great theologians, go and read a bit up on the, on the history of Christianity, and you'll quickly find that your particular cultural instantiation is just one sort of moment in a, in a much bigger story. And that alone, I think, can help just to to kind of help people realise, you know, that things are more nuanced and deeper, you know, um, mm-hmm. than than they thought. And when it comes to listening to, you know, sometimes voices that are very critical of Christianity, you know, the atheists, the skeptics, and so on. The problem is if you if you kind of um, live in a Christian bubble, the problem with bubbles is they they are apt to get popped. And as soon as you step outside of that, and these days we're only a Google click away from you know all kinds of anti-Christian philosophy or theories. So I think that, again, it, it's it's I think it's really important, especially for the, for our young people, that that they get exposed to those ideas, but in a way that's kind of appropriate for them. Like it's a, it's a bit like, you know, you get exposed to a virus in order to build up your immunity to it. And you say sure. you're only given a very low dose, aren't you? But it, it helps so that when the real thing comes along, your your body's ready for it. And I, I almost feel the same about <laughs> apologetics yeah. is we need to, we need to kind of be helping people and not kind of shielding our young people from ever hearing anything critical of Christianity, because otherwise you, you're not preparing them for when they actually do go to college or the big wide world and suddenly they run into that really skeptical professor or whoever they are and we actually need to be you know be saying hey kids i heard this interesting argument against god the other day or i ran into this skeptic or and doing whatever's appropriate to sort of start to help people understand there are arguments against christianity out there at a point where you can actually deliver some helpful responses and and that's what i've kind of tried to do obviously with the show is Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. a lot of people asked, you know, especially when I was starting this the show, why would you want to bring on atheists onto a Christian radio station? And, you know, doesn't it sort of shake the faith of young Christians if they're hearing these arguments? And yes, arguably it could um, do. And I'm not saying this is the first thing you would necessarily point everyone to. But at the same time, the value of actually exposing people to these arguments in an environment where hopefully they will also hear a cogent Christian response, I think is actually far outweighs any of the dangers because yeah. actually it helps people to realize this is real world stuff. There are people who don't believe in Christianity or who are actively campaigning against it, but there are also good Christian thinkers out there who I can learn from who, who have a way of responding. And, and it's in actually modeling the conversations as well. I think that it helps to give people the confidence to, to kind of think, well, I, I, maybe I could step into a conversation like that. Maybe I could, mm-hmm. That that gives me a clue as to how I would could respond. I mean, in summary, I think Christian confidence in that sense is not about simply knowing all the answers to all the questions. It's about having enough confidence to actually listen to someone who is anti-Christian or or, or arguing against your faith or saying something that you hadn't heard before or, or potentially disagree with, and not immediately respond out of fear or, or anger, you know, because they are challenging some deeply held belief of yours, but rather to be able to graciously listen and respond in a kind of open and honest and in a way where you're not sort of turning it into a, it's not a knee jerk response of fear, uh, which I think so often the way sadly Christians do respond when they, when they, because they're not used to hearing those arguments. They haven't been kind of brought up in an environment where they've been, they've had to ever really think or have that faith tested. And so I just hope that, you know, in that sense, you know, we can do a better job of doing that, preparing people for that and hopefully you know the, the unbelievable show has had a bit of a role in in doing that for for people who've listened to it well, very good well justin our time has been flying and it's getting late and uh mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. 
You mentioned you're coming out with a new book, but are there mm. any other events that you want to point people to or things just on the horizon? Yeah, there's there's some some interesting things coming up. So the book that you mentioned, um, now that's not out for a little while. Uh, that's in September that that comes out. But it, but yeah, I would love people to get hold of it. It's not even available for pre order or anything yet. But but once it is, it's um it's going to be titled "The Surprising Rebirth of Belief in God." That's that's the one to look out for. That that'll be published by Tyndale in the US and um, probably by SBCK here in the UK. The next big thing, kind of on the unbelievable calendar, is the launch of our next season of the Big Conversation. So um, that's our special kind of video discussion series. Uh, we're back in studio, which is exciting. Not my spare room, uh, which, uh, <laughs> which, so we, it, and it looks gorgeous. And the first, the first video um, debate podcast that we're releasing, it comes out on Easter weekend, Friday, the 7th of April. And it's, it's a well-known skeptic, Bart Ehrman, joining us for that one, hmm. along with um, New Testament scholar, Justin Bass, who's oh, written a, yeah. a great book on the evidence for the resurrection. So they, they're they both in person in a studio with me. It's 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 shot beautifully. I'm really pleased with the way it looks. Uh, but it's also a really feisty debate. So that'll be a fun way to get into this new season of The all Big right. Conversation. So so look out for that. And you can sign up and get all the updates and everything else at thebigconversation.show. Wow, that sounded great. It sounded like I was listening to your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm so smooth at doing these links and these, you know, these promos. Oh, know. Uh, I'm such a, mm. such a self-publicist, Brian. Well, it's been a great conversation and I appreciate you coming back on the podcast. And of course, we'll point everybody to your resources and uh, the unbelievable radio program and podcast in the show notes. Thank you so much, Justin. Well, Chad and Brian, thank you so much for having me on it. It was real fun to chat. Thanks for listening to the podcast. If you have a question you'd like us to address or just a message for us, feedback, good or bad, you can either email us at podcast at apologetics315.com or leave a voice message for us using SpeakPipe. Just go to speakpipe.com slash apologetics315 to leave us a message. And remember, if you include a Ghostbusters quote in your question, we guarantee that we'll read it on the podcast. We also ensure up to 50% better quality answers. Also, if you've enjoyed today's podcast, please leave a review in iTunes or the podcast platform of your choice, and please share this episode with a friend if you found it useful. Remember, you can find lots of apologetics resources at apologetics315.com, along with show notes for today's episode. Find Chad's apologetics stuff over at Truth Bomb Apologetics. That's truthbomb.blogspot.com. This has been Brian Auten and Chad Gross for the Apologetics 315 podcast, and thanks for listening. Thank <laughs> you.